Hey everybody, and welcome to my video on the Seagull 4B. Yeah, it's flying like a seagull. Flying away and hitting a studio lamp. <laughs> welcome to my video on the Seagull 4, 4B. In this video, we're going to go through every interface element on this camera, and I'll tell you how to use them and what they do, and how to improve your photography with this interesting to use camera. This is a fixed lens TLR. It has no light meter. Shutter speeds of bulb up to 1 300th of a second. It has 100% viewfinder magnification in the top here, meaning that what you see on the viewfinder is the exact same size as what will be seen on the film. It has 100% viewfinder frame coverage with the exception that what you're seeing comes from the viewing lens, not from the taking lens, but the viewing lens projects the same size image onto the uh, screen as the taking lens projects onto the negative, and that's because they're the same lens. Well, when I say they're the same lens, I mean that they are both 75 millimeter f3.5 lenses. This has a clear field focusing screen with six by four and a half grid lines because it also has a six by four and a half insert, which we'll see. And the flash on this camera syncs at any shutter speed from bulb up to one three hundredth. The Seagull 4B is, insofar as I know, one of the last models of TLRs still being made in China that stems from a long line of TLRs dating back to the 1960s. And it is an entry-level TLR. It is very basic. The shutter is not coupled to the film advance. The focus is a knob. The film advance is a knob. The shutter operates independently of, of everything except the flash sync when you have flash hooked up to it. It's incredibly basic. It, literally anyone can pick this up and have a pretty good sense of how to use it fairly quickly. The 4B is the entry-level version of Seagull's 4A series. The 4A has mid and advanced level cameras. This is similar to those, but stripped down significantly. So, sort of like the way that the Raleigh cords were stripped down versions of the Raleigh Flex cameras. The Seagull 4B is made at the Shanghai General Camera Factory in Shanghai, China. They went into production in 1964. Uh, and went out of production in the mid-1980s. The 4A bodies are still uh, produced today. Uh, I had read somewhere that said the 4B bodies are as well, but I honestly, I won't lie, I don't think that's the case. I think that the 4B is out of production. Uh, this was preceded by previous budget model Shanghai brand TLRs. The Shanghai Camera Company became the Seagull Camera Com Company, if I understand. Uh, that company's history correctly. I, I believe that Seagull came about when a number of different camera manufacturers in Shanghai merged. This, is made, this was made concurrent with early Seagull 4A models and was followed by the Seagull 4B1, which would be, which would be the one that I believe is still in, in production. The 4B is out of production. The 4B1 is, is in production. So if you have your 4B Let's take a look at what features it has. We'll talk about the buttons that are on here, and then later in the video, we'll talk about what they do, how to use them, and we'll go through the process of taking a photo with this camera. So right here on the top, we have the camera strap lugs, and this is what you would attach your camera strap to. Here's the viewfinder cover right here that says Seagull on it. Here is the uh, serial number for your camera. If you have lost this plate, as sometimes happens with some of these, there is no way to find out what your serial number was. Um, but you can see the serial number begins with 4B, which is the model, and then a number of some meaning. Here inside the viewfinder, we have the viewfinder glass, and you can see the framing lines right there. There's a cross mark which you can see in the center and then there on the the front is the top of the 645 frame and there well you can't see it now but let's try it this way well and there at the bottom I think you can see the bottom of the 645 frame but but the uh, the glass that you're seeing right now aligns with the 6x6 frame 
This has a magnifying glass on it for fine focusing detail. And there's a button right here. And the magnifying glass, when you look down at it, lines up with the center of the frame and allows you to perform very fine and accurate focusing. There's also a sport finder that just flips up. And if you look through the back of the camera right here, this allows you to take quick snapshots that are pre-focused and roughly aligned correctly. And that's pretty good for sporting events or shooting when you want to just pick it up and line it up and take a picture. Here we are on the camera's front and you can see here we have the nameplate which is up here. Some, some of these in, say seagull in English. This is the um, Chinese characters for seagull. I'm pretending right now that I can read Chinese. It says seagull. And uh, here is the viewing lens. It's a HIO SA85 f3.5 75 millimeter lens. Same here for the taking lens. Same lens. Here is the aperture lever that allows you to select your aperture. I'll show you what that looks like. You can see that the aperture opens and closes with that. And it's a five bladed aperture so you get some some pretty great pentagon shapes in the uh, the uh, highlights when you use it. Here's your shutter speed selector and this changes the shutter speed. I prefer to select the shutter speed prior to cocking the shutter because many TLRs prefer that, but uh, you, you could probably get away with it. I wouldn't recommend it. I really don't recommend changing shutter speeds after the shutter is cocked because um, I'll tell you, when I just did it there, I felt like it was grinding a little bit and clearly did not like that. So your best bet is not to do that. Here is your self timer lever and to activate the self timer. You just drop that down to the bottom, cock the shutter, and there you go, self timer. As we've seen a bunch of times already uh, with, this, with this video, here's the shutter release button and there's a little screw and thread there for a cable release. Here is your flash PC port, and this is the lever that you use to cock your shutter so you can take a picture. And there's not a whole lot to see on the back of the camera. Here are two red windows. This one's Mark 12 and this one's Mark 16. And when you advance the film, uh, if you are taking six by six images, you can fit 12 of those per roll. And if you're taking six by four and a half, you can fit 16. So these would be this corresponds with the uh, number of frames that you're taking. That's determined by whether or not you have the mask on your camera. I'm going to go a little bit out of order. And this is the mask. This is the six by four and a half mask that just slides right in there to take six by four and a half centimeter images. And when it's out, it takes six by six centimeter images. Here on the camera's bottom, we have not a whole lot. Now you can see here there's some, some glue, that's some plyo bond. One of the things about these Chinese cameras is that the glue on the leatherette has not held up very well over the years, and so many of these peel. Well, it hasn't held up, but that doesn't stop the leatherette from curling significantly, so it's incredibly difficult, even with good glue, to get the leatherette to re-adhere well on these cameras unfortunately, so a lot of them have peeling leather like this one does, and I've already glued it as well. It's just, maybe I'm, it's possible that I'm just got, I've got no skills in gluing. I'm not going to rule that out. But at any rate, uh, if you're going to buy one of these, just know that a lot of them have peeling leather and that uh, you're going to need some plyo bond to put it back in place. You cannot use crazy glue because crazy glue off gases, uh, adhesive compounds that will adhere to your lenses and cause them to get foggy, and there's no way to clean that off. It just ruins lenses. So at any rate, here's your lock and unlock. C for close, O for open, which are Hoi and Quan. Uh, Hoi and Quan. I'm again pretending that I can read Chinese. Um, my brother's father-in-law helped me with that. And then you just dial it over to open. So here's a, a locking button right here. Let's make sure that you don't accidentally uh, dial it. And you can see the arrow indicates whether you're closed or open. So just push that lock in, rotate, and that's how you open up the back. 
Here on this side, I know your first question is what the heck is going on with that film advance knob? This is the film advance knob. And why on earth does it have a, uh, a state quarter from Fort McHenry? What? Oh, from Maryland. Why does it have a Maryland state quarter on it? Well, you know, like I said, a lot of the leather on these cameras peels, including the leather covering the knobs. Well, it just happens that that is the exact same size as a U.S. quarter, and the U.S. quarter is not going to peel. So when I've gotten some of these and the leather has peeled or is missing, a lot of it is just missing, uh, I just replace it with a U.S. quarter that I use plyo bond to hold in place so that if I ever need to get in here, it's, it's undoable, and I can, uh, I can get in to tighten up the film advance knob if needed. But that's a good way to help keep your film advance knob protected if, uh, if the leather is missing. Here on the other side, you can see we've got a Virginia State quarter for the covering on the, the focusing knob. And you can focus from one meter to infinity. This is your distance scale from f3.5, which is your minimum aperture, or your maximum aperture rather, out to f22, which is your minimum. And the higher the number, the greater the depth of field is going to be. So what this allows you to do is right now I'm focused at infinity at f3.5. If I put infinity out to f16 and then I adjust this to f16, oop, yeah that's it, f16, now I know that everything from infinity down to just shy of four meters is going to be in focus. So we'll call it 10 feet to infinity. Or likewise, if I wanted to do a close focus, here I put one meter at f16, and now I know everything out to about one and a quarter meters is in focus. So that gives me some idea of what's going to be in focus when I take the picture at a given aperture setting. These are the pins that help keep the film take-up spool and the new film spool in place when they're inside the camera. So here is the inside of the camera. We're going to take a look at what's going on in here. This is the film take-up spool. So when you put your fresh roll of film in, it will be taken up on this spool here. And this is typically the previous roll of film that you used, the spool from the center of it. Here is the mask, the six by four and a half mask, which very many of these have lost. It, I, I had to buy like six of these before one of them came with this mask. Uh, it was not easy to find. We'll take it out for right now. Here's the camera obscura. This is where the light comes through the lens to reach the film. These are film guide rollers that help the film proceed through the camera smoothly when they come around this corner and then advance to the film take-up spool. These inner silver rails are the our film guide rails that work with the film pressure plate to keep the film flat on plane right here. These outer four dots right here are the outside guide rails that keep the film from moving to the side as it goes through so that it proceeds smoothly through the camera. This is the new film placement spool area right here. So while we've got the camera back open, let's load some film. The first thing we need to decide is what format we're gonna shoot. Are we going to shoot six by four and a half, which is exclusively a landscape format, or are we going to shoot the square format six by six? So if we decide to shoot six by four and a half, we need to insert the mask here so that the frames don't overlap. And it just, just fits right in here like that. Now, uh, one thing to note, if you put it in like this, uh, it will fit, but your frames will overlap on the top and bottom. And you'll end up with like four and a half by four and a half uh, images in the very center that, that don't really look very good or uh, at any rate so don't don't load it like that it gets it gets loaded in like this and will will put you in a position where you can only shoot landscape i suppose if you wanted to shoot 12 six by four and a half in portrait orientation you you could but you'd be wasting a whole lot of film on the sides here it's best if you're going to shoot 12 just to shoot six by six so let's uh let's put this in we're going to shoot six by four and a half today now we saw on the back that there were the two red windows, one for 12 and one for 16. On the numbers, we can see there are 
one, one, and one. This is a six by four and a half, six by six, six by nine. These bottom ones here we will not be using at all when we load the film. So if you wanted to go, so if you took six by six images, you would see these numbers here, these ones and twos. With six by four and a half, you would see those numbers. To load film, we're simply going to pull this out. Now, if you've ever used a Raleigh or a Zeiss, you'll know that you can just rotate this and it will lock in place. That is not the case with the Seagull bodies. So just pull it out, and then we pull out the leader here. We're going to run it up to the front of the camera and feed it into this take-up spool. There's a couple different ways to do that. You can either feed it into the take-up spool in the body, or sometimes it's a little bit easier to feed it into the take-up spool when it's outside of the body. So roll it up a couple times, and then put it back into the camera. Sometimes, sometimes it's not easier. There we go. Almost there. All right, that's it. Okay, so now we're going to advance the film. However you get it onto the take-up spool, you're going to advance the film until you see the double arrow come around the corner. And now, we're going to close it and lock it. And let's open up the red windows. One thing I like to do is take some masking tape. And if I'm going to shoot 6x6, six six, I will put masking tape over this window so I can only see the numbers in here. Likewise, I'm going to shoot 6x4.5, I'll put it over this window so I can only see the numbers in here. That makes sure that I don't accidentally uh, count the wrong frame. So now let's start advancing the... There you go, you can see the, the arrow passing through there. And we're going to see some more arrows come through. And here's some lines letting me know we're getting close. And we can see Kodak film, since we're shooting 6x4.5, we're going to use this window. If we were shooting 6x6, we'd use that one. One. Now we're stopped. This is where we want to stop to take our first image. Likewise, if we were shooting 6x6, we'd stop with the one in this window. We want to close those so that we don't um, have numbers on the back of our images if too much light gets through the, the red window. So now that we've got the film loaded into the camera, let's run through the process of taking a photo. The first thing you want to do is get your settings set correctly. So now let's say that you've got 100 ISO film in here. There's no light meter, so we're going to use the Sunny 16 rule to take pictures. And what that means is that at f16, your shutter speed should be the closest setting to the same number as your film speed. So in this case, it would be 1 1 25th of a second at a little bit, little bit less than 1 than f16, not f11, but, you know, in that ballpark. And that's going to give you a pretty close exposure. If you are in a shaded area, you could do something like an f8. If you're inside, you'd want to shoot it wide open and probably at a slower shutter speed. Or if you have a handheld light meter, you can take a light meter reading and get your settings and adjust them here. So let's say we've got a full sun. We're going to go with f16 at 1 1 25th of a second. We're going to cock the shutter here. Now we're ready to go. We don't want to hit the shutter just yet. Next, we're going to focus the image. Now, I'm going to ask you to, to play along with me here and pretend that this, this light bulb isn't a scene and that it can actually be focused. It's, it's too close to focus, unfortunately. But to focus it, you just rotate the knob here, and you can see the closer you focus, the further the lenses get away from the camera body. So this is maximum closest focus. This is infinity focus. So we're going to focus, and that, okay, we'll call that really, that looks good to our eye. Let's do a fine focus here. Use the, micro, the magnifying glass here to get perfect focus. Okay, now it's perfect. And we don't want to dilly-dally, so we'll just take the picture by hitting the shutter release. And put that back, put that back. And the next thing we need to do is go back to the back of the camera. We just took exposure one. Now let's ex forward it to exposure two. Close the back, and we're ready to go take our next photo. It's really pretty simple. The hardest part about taking a picture with this camera is getting your settings correct. So having a handheld light meter or a smartphone light meter app, uh, those, those are close enough that you can correct any mistakes in the dark room after you get your film back, or they'll, they'll be close enough that it's within the film's developing tolerance. Uh, either one of those options is generally pretty good. 
So let's say that you wanted to take a double exposure. These cameras are awesome for double exposures because the shutter is not linked to the film advance. So here's the process for taking a double exposure. You can just click away until your heart's content without ever advancing the film and get a thousand exposures on the same frame. You, you would get nothing back, it would be garbage, but I mean, in theory that works. You take your meter reading and it tells you f5.6 at 1 60th of a second. Well, let's not adjust the aperture because we want to keep the depth of field the same, but we need to have half as much light for each exposure, otherwise the camera is going to have two exposures on the same frame that have the same the, the proper amount of light which is twice as much light as is needed so we need two exposures that have the proper that have half the amount of light to get the proper amount amount of light so if our meter says f5.6 at 1 60th we adjust this to 1 1 25th now we're going to cock the shutter take the first exposure stage the second one however we want it to be different take the second exposure and then we then then we would advance the film to the next frame let's try it slightly so let's try the scenario over again 1 60th f5.6 we're going to go to 1 1 25th and take our first first exposure now we're going to walk around leave it for a couple days we want to come back and get our next exposure and later that one says it's going to be 1 15th at f5.6 because it's it's dimmer now well okay 1 15th is proper exposure, we need to have half as much light. We'll come back and do it at 1 30th. And now we have a double exposure that's in two different lighting situations, days, months, weeks apart, and that have two properly exposed, two half exposed images on the same frame for one pop properly exposed double exposure. So that's that's really it for this camera. It's um it's really pretty fantastic uh, for for beginners. It's a it's it is absolutely a fantastic beginner TLR. Uh, you know you can use your flash PC port here to to use a flash with it if you'd like. Very easy. Any shutter speed works. Very easy to take double exposures. The lenses on this are surprisingly good. They have tons and tons of character, especially up close. They're they're actually. At infinity focus and close, I would say the lenses are very boring and sterile, uh, sharp, but very technical. When you get up to close focus, at least on this one, then the lenses start having all kinds of crazy co uh, coma and aberration around the edges that make the images really, really neat to look at. And we'll see some of that in the sample photos. You'll see what I'm talking about. So, but this uh, is a very basic camera. It can be picked up and learned in about five minutes. I'm not kidding about that either. If you know, if you have ever used a film camera, this is going to be extremely easy to learn. If you've never used a film camera, this is going to be extremely easy to learn. It's a great first TLR. It's very easy to use. It relies on tried and proven mechanical technologies that date back to the 1940s. There's nothing whatsoever innovative about anything on this camera, and that's one of the reasons that it's so brilliant. Interesting thing about the Seagull 4B is that it's based on an earlier model called the Shanghai. So it's a copy of the Shanghai. The Shanghai itself was a copy of a Japanese-made camera, possibly the Beauty Flex or Ares Flex which was itself a copy of the Raleigh cords. So we have the original Raleigh cord, then we have the Japanese copy, then we have the Shanghai copy, now we have the Seagull copy. This is a fourth generation copy, but it does not suffer at all for that. It is a great little camera to use. So a few things not to do with this camera. Don't touch the shutter or lenses with your fingers. If, if you can touch the shutter, you've taken some things apart. So it's a good idea not to do that. Um, and also don't touch the mirror in here if you take it apart to clean anything because the mirror is surface coated silver and your finger oils will tarnish it or remove the silver. Don't leave your camera in your car because the uh, shutter has a whole bunch of oils in it that help it function properly and if in the heat they'll get very thin, get to places they shouldn't. Uh, get thicker again when it cools off and then they'll be gumming up the works. And likewise if you leave it out in the winter then the, the cold will break the oils down and cause them to get gummy within the mechanism and then 
that your timing will be off and your shutter will not work as it's supposed to. Don't store your camera in a plastic bag or box because moisture will get in there and it will cause fungus to grow, especially on the lenses and in the leather. Do not let your camera get wet. It's not weather sealed. It's not gonna stand up to getting wet at all. That will cause a lot of the components to rust and be ruined. And just remember that your camera is a precision tool and should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you take care of your camera, your camera will take care of you. If this video was helpful, please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know I'm on the right track and that I'm producing content which is helpful to you. If you have any questions, please leave them below. I'm pretty good about getting back in a timely manner and answering your questions. If you have thoughts on videos or suggestions for new videos, I'm more than happy to make those if I have the equipment and technical knowledge. Uh, you can subscribe to my channel and that will let you know when I have new videos coming out. And one last thing before we go, thank you guys for watching and take great photos.